When are we going to start asking different questions about autism and looking at this epidemic in a different way? Just a few generations ago, it was around 1 in 1,500 kids, if it was even that, that were being diagnosed or showing up with autistic characteristics. Fast forward to today, 2023, that number was 1 in 36. And even from just 10, 15 years ago, 15, 20 years ago, we've gone from 1 in 150 to this rate. So there is something crazy going on. And no, it's not just our genetics because our genetics can't change in 20 years or even 50 or 100 years. There's got to be something else at play that's not really being talked about. And that is what this video is about. Parents, uh, caregivers, providers, if you work with kids with autism, this message is for you. We want to look at this from a different lens, not just writing it off as a genetic issue that you don't really have any influence or have any say over. We want to put an empowering spin using some of the more emerging science and understanding of what's going on. And we want to look at this from a lens of what can we do? What action steps are there? Because that is really the key, right? Knowledge is only useful for us if there's an application, if there is a practical use of it. So that's what this little brief video is for. No, we can't really unpack all the science and neurology to autism in a 5, 10, 15 minute video, however long this ends up being. But I want to provide just a snippet of what's really at play. So yeah, we've got to understand that this isn't a genetic thing, right? That is the starting point. It's not something that can just flip like that in this short time frame that we've seen the skyrocketing rates of autism. And especially when we think about it in the lens of we've had so many other chronic neurodevelopmental health challenges skyrocketing as well, right? We've got more kids with sensory issues, more kids with communication or speech delays, anxiety, ADHD, and focus challenges. This isn't just something unique to autism. We're seeing more kids struggling across the board. So we need to look at this from a new comprehensive perspective. And I love the conversation that's going around. Um, and, and using that phrase of neurodiversity, I think that is the understanding we need to be moving towards is that everybody's not the same, especially if we look at education models. It is so off track with how we teach kids as if everyone is the same. We expect the same um, standardized results and scores from them. That's not how the biology works. That's not how development works. And that's definitely not how we should be treating our kids. So yes, neurodiversity is 100% true. Our personality traits are different. And we don't need to fit everybody into the same little box and assume that they're all going to be the same. But there are certain core functional things that we expect and we need our kids to be able to do so that they're reaching their full potential, so that they are being their best versions of themselves. Stuff like communication, right? We've got to be able to interact and communicate, which hits on social connection, right? We need to be social creatures. We need to be able to have relationship. We need to be able to understand cues and be able to interact with each other. Sure, you're, you're going to have a gradient of that. You're going to have super empathetic people that are really in touch, really aware of certain feelings and they're able to connect with that better. And then you're going to have people that struggle with that more, but we've got to be somewhere in that spectrum, right? We can't have a complete disconnect with social connection. And then sensory thing is uh, sensory input or sensory regulation is another huge thing we see within that autism spectrum world. Sure, neurodiversity is going to exist. There's going to be a range of what that normal looks like, but not being able to handle different sounds or noises, not being able to handle different textures, different environments, different sensations, that really uh, makes it difficult for our kids to regulate and to adapt to their environments. And that's the name of the game of what we're trying to accomplish for kids, is just help them be more adaptable, help them regulate better. So what is at play? If we have a non-genetic issue going on, what is at the root of it? That's where we can look at some of the different environmental factors. So when we look at that, there are so many things at play, and especially if we hone in on early life stuff. That would look like maybe maternal or prenatal stressors. We see a huge connection and correlation between what are the early life, prenatal, maternal challenges in life, and how does that set up a kid for struggles? One of the big uh, connecting points and factors in that is that maternal and prenatal stress tends to lead into more of birth intervention or birth trauma. And there's a huge connection. And this is one of the areas, thankfully, there is growing research and growing um, a growing body of dots being connected to better understand what's going on here. Huge connections between extra birth trauma, whether that's C-section, forceps, vacuum extraction, or just hands-on manual delivery, long prolonged labors, anything like that is going to add extra stress on that kid, which is going to mess up some of those key early developmental factors for them. So maternal prenatal stress, the early birth trauma, birth interventions, and then in that early phase of life, any medication use, any Tylenol, any antibiotics, any toxic exposures, 
all of those things are huge triggers as well. And we're hitting on those early things, right? This matters at any point, but early is so key because the most neurons, the most synapses our brain will ever form is around eight or 10 months. That is when this peaks. So if we limit that ceiling, if we're limited and affected in that early, early neurodevelopmental range, it's going to affect the whole lifespan of development. So that early stuff matters. And then there's a huge bucket of stuff beyond that. There's a growing body of uh, research around EMFs, like electromagnetic radiation, different mold, household toxins are a huge deal. Food additives, man, has our food changed so much in the last handful of decades. Uh, a whole can of worms, we could go into that. GMOs, Monsanto, you, you've probably been down that Google rabbit trail already. Um, plus so many other medical invention, interventions that are being connected and associated with these. But the bottom line is that this isn't a gene thing, right? There is no autism gene. Uh, if at best you wanna make a genetic connection, there's around 100 genes that have been connected with a risk for autism, but those genes are only present in 10% or so of the cases. So it's not that, we've gotta be looking at other factors and looking at how we can support kids and limit those environmental stressors to get their development on track from day one. So listen, the reason that these things are all connected, uh, it can really be summarized in just a stress response in the nervous system. That is why we're so obsessed with this as pediatric chiropractors, is because we work with the nervous system. When our development is turned into fight or flight, when our optimal growth and development in what should be our parasympathetic wellness mode gets shut off, our system gets put into stress, well then all of those optimal wellness functions get shut off too. And so that's what we get to see is these early life challenges are so damaging because it puts a kid into a sympathetic or fight or flight state early on, which is hard to get out of them. Uh, it's hard to get out of it because those nerves really fire and wire together. Those pathways get more and more dominant and get more and more locked in so that it gets more um, stuck going into the future tracks. So we've got to get the immune, the gut, all of those neurodevelopmental pathways turned back on by addressing this early on. And don't ever feel like it's too late, right? If you don't have a newborn here, if you've got a four-year-old that's maybe on the brink of being diagnosed with autism, or you've got a seven-year-old or a 10-year-old or anything in that range, you still need to be addressing this. You can still be making a huge, huge impact, but the earlier, the better, right? That's the message that we're going to constantly be sounding. The sooner, the better that we can support our kids the more impact that future um, growth and that future trajectory will have. So we're gonna link to a, another article to dig into this topic even more because this doesn't even scratch the surface. So check that out. Please reach out to our team, send us a message here if you've got more questions or thoughts on it because I know this is a big one uh, and I know that um, you know this doesn't even come close to doing it justice. Hope that helps guys. Have an awesome rest of your day and we'll talk to you soon.